Hi everyone, welcome to EA Together in the spirit of Aviation Week. I'm Mark Forrest with... And I'm Joe Norris. And we're going to be talking about sheet metal construction for this hour in our special workshop series during the spirit of Aviation Week. So, sheet metal construction, Joe, that is one of the most popular ways to build airplanes today. Yep, it has become the pre predominant way that uh, people are building home builds. Uh, the largest number of home builds are being produced today are home built uh, sheet metal, Vans aircraft, Sonics aircraft, Zenith aircraft are very popular. Lots and lots of examples of those out flying. And uh, the vast majority of the new kits going out the door are, are sheet metal airplanes in this day and age. And it's really overtaken all the other types of construction for many different reasons. Back in the day, when you build a sheet metal airplane, basically you got uh, essentially a roll of plans yep. and you'd buy a couple rolls of aluminum and have at it. Yeah, you had to do all the layout, all the cutting, all the measuring, everything was all done off a set of plans and you had to be prepared to work from the raw stock and make every individual part of the aircraft. So it not only involved the cutting and the riveting and the, and the welding, and, or not welding, but uh, uh, measuring, but it, uh, it involved building jigs and forms to like make ribs and stuff like that. And it was just every individual part had to be constructed from raw materials. So you became actually uh, wearing many hats. You were literally the kit manufacturer manufacturing the parts right. so you'd have to have a skill set to do that right. and then you'd have the parts and then you put them together so now you're the kit, the kit builder right. so it took a tremendous amount of time and, and it was really challenging because uh, some of those plan sets back when were well let's put it this way a lot of people would build an airplane, scratch built an airplane, they'd fly to Oshkosh, and suddenly there'd be hundreds of people surrounding the airplane saying, I want to build, I one, build of one of these too. Yep. And, and the particular builder might not have been a draftsman or an engineer, most of them were, but some of them were just building in their garage shops and uh, hammered out yep. a crude set of plans. I right, mean, and a lot of times it wasn't even the original builder because they didn't have those skills and yeah. one of the other people that wanted to build the aircraft did have the skills and they'd work with the, the, the original the originator of the airplane <laughs> to get the actual plan set put together so that they could actually market them then to the to you know, the broader community sure and uh, they were there, were there were various different varieties of them some were pretty detailed for their time a lot of hand drawn stuff not yeah. much computer CAD stuff or anything. no not at all and but a lot of them were really really basic where it left an awful lot to the individual builder to decide just how they wanted to to do certain things yeah. where to put the throttle control you know exactly how to make the seats whether they wanted to make them adjustable or make them out of wood or make it sure. out of metal all that stuff was left to the to the craftsmen that were the builders and that was all fine and dandy except it really took a lot of time and so a lot of the aircraft uh, the the projects went on for years and years and years and often never got completed or got handed down to somebody else and maybe the third or fourth owner of that project finally completed it but the completion rates were way lower than they are today, yeah. like 20, 30 percent maybe sure. of the aircraft that were started were actually completed. And this is all pre-internet days, so right. the information you'd get would essentially come once a month yep. through the Sport Aviation magazine yep. or yep. Uh, trading uh, information via letters, news remember those? Yeah, news <laughs> news I mean, newsletters. News, and, if, and they, if they did have a builder group, it was a printed newsletter that came out maybe yeah. every couple of months or maybe once a month. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, or a lot of phone calls, <laughs> a lot of trips to look at other aircraft. And yeah, there's a, there's no a instant communication at all. Exactly. So, um, you know, a couple of things really uh, push that ahead. Uh, first thing being the internet and the availability of information is a tremendous boon to the home build. Huge. Uh, you know, and the other thing is the computer, computer aided design and drafting and, and all of the things that finally led up to CNC machines and yeah. laser drills and all these wonderful things that we yeah. have today that makes making these parts so much easier um, and as the community grew more and more people wanted to build airplanes and of course they wanted to build them a little bit easier a little bit faster sure it drove the kit manufacturers to improve their processes yes and so it drove them down the line of getting these more modern equipment and, and uh, you know up their game so to speak yep so that they'd be able to, to uh, deliver a more complete more concise product and that's really transformed the way we do things, transform the industry of the home, the, if we want to call it an industry, the home built aircraft industry, right. but also has impacted aviation in general because mm -hmm. now you have something that is much more readily available, more accessible, mm -hmm. uh, relatively speaking, inexpensive compared to uh, factory built aircraft. Right. And performance, just incredible. Yep. And easy to build, I mean, to the point where now, there, <laughs> 
excuse me, almost like building Legos is yeah. what it comes down yeah, to. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much a follow the plans uh, page by page and do what they tell you in the right order. And, and, you, and you know, there are a few pieces you have to, you have to do some drilling and some cutting yet, sure. uh, because the FAA requires some fabrication to be an yeah. amateur built kit. Right. But for the most part, it's a lot of, of following the plans and assembling in the proper order and using the appropriate tools and, and materials. And you, you put the aircraft together. And instant airplane, <laughs> Just, almost. Almost, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it takes a while, but yeah. not that bad. Not, not nearly compared to the plans built airplanes that we, the legacy exactly. airplanes that took years and years and years. Um, you know, these aircraft, especially with the more advanced kits, the quick build kits, uh, which you'll talk about in a, in a minute here. Yeah. Uh, you know, a person that wants to devote some time to do that can build an airplane in less than a year if they yeah, want to. Yeah, easy. Yeah. So what we like to do in this hour is talk about the types of kits that are available, specifically uh, dealing in with sheet metal aircraft. We'll talk about setting up your workshop, getting it set to build your airplane, about getting it delivered. That's another important thing that a lot of people overlook. We'll mm -hmm. talk about delivery of your aircraft and literally how easy it is. We'll talk about the tools that are involved and do a little demonstration on building an aircraft. Today we're going to be doing sheet metal construction using solid rivets. So this is a traditional method where we're using a rivet gun and bucking bar and we'll show you the techniques of doing that. Uh, we'll talk about finishing your airplane and then ultimately getting it flying. So let's start. If we pull up the uh, first graphic, one of the more popular kits is what we call our standard kit. Mm -hmm. So the manufacturer has made the, most of the parts for you. Again, with CNC technology, mm -hmm. computer technology, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. they have cut out the parts, they have laid out the parts, most of them, and they've done most of the hard work. So right. if there's like a uh, engine mount, uh, fiberglass cowling, mm -hmm. plexiglass canopy, mm -hmm. those hard things are done yeah. for you. And a lot of the larger parts, like the wing spars, um, a, a lot of the kits already have the wing spars pre-assembled because it's a fairly critical part of the aircraft. Right. And it's a major part that takes a lot of effort to get put together in a home shop. Exactly. And so uh, a lot of the kit manufacturers are, you know, those large structural parts are doing those as part of the kit and sure. that saves the builder the time and effort of putting that together. And gives them a little peace of mind as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's kind of a standard kit as we see up on, on the, uh, on the uh, screen right now. That's a big chunk of what people start out with, right. building a standard kit. Mm -hmm. You still have quite a bit of work done, but there is a lot of stuff already done for you. Right. The next type of kit that we have is what we call a quick build kit. So we'll, we'll flip to that right now. So the quick build is a, a variation of this, okay? Mm -hmm. Where the manufacturer does more for you. Literally out of the box, it almost looks like an airplane. Right. The wings might be done, the fuselage might be pretty much roughed out. Yep. There still is a fairly substantial amount of parts to, to assemble, to fabricate, and mm -hmm. to put together. But it uh, comes, comes down to how much the manufacturer can do for the kit uh, builder right. with regards to keeping it as an experimental amateur built aircraft. Right, they still have to meet that what they call the major portion criteria, which commonly hear the people talk about the 51% rule. Um, the amateur builder or builders have to do more than 50% of the fabrication and assembly tasks. So the FAA actually has a checklist and the manufacturers can get those checklists and they can go through and check off just enough items so that they stay just underneath that 50%. Sure. They'll do absolutely everything they can possibly do and still make the aircraft legal to certificate in the amateur bill category and send it out the door to the, to the customer and then they've got just that much to do to make it uh, meet those requirements. So lots more stuff. Whereas a standard kit, uh, the manufacturer's probably done maybe 30% of the task, sure. maybe 35 even. Yeah. Now they're going to be doing 49% of the yep. task. I mean, right up to the right up to the very limit. So it makes it very quick yeah. and very easy to get through the process of building. And ultimately, that's what we want to do. Exactly. We want to put together an amazing airplane and get it in the air as quickly as possible. So that's what the quick build kit right. is. Right, and it's kind of funny, as the, as the quick build kits have become more and more prevalent in the industry, they, t they still call those quick build kits. Now, instead of saying a standard kit, everybody says, well, that's a slow build kit. <laughs> and a quick build kit and a slow, slow build, build kit. kit. Yeah. Which is still way, way faster than the old legacy airplanes, sure. but it's slower than the quick build kit. Yeah. So it all depends, and you're trading money for time. Yeah, that's uh, what it comes down to. You're, you're either gonna pay the manufacturer to do those tasks and pay their labor rates and all that stuff, yeah. and save yourself the time and the effort, or you're gonna save a little money up front and you're gonna spend more of your own time 
to do those extra tasks sure. to make up between the difference between the standard kit and the quick build kit. Yeah, and it gives you some, some good options. Yeah. The, other, the other thing that's nice too is the way that the kit manufacturer packaged the kits in that you can, don't necessarily have to buy the entire kit at once. You can start out with an empennage kit Right. and then move to the fuselage kit, move to the wing kit, and so on and yeah. so forth. And of course, don't forget that for those that really, really want to save money and don't mind spending the time, there still are uh, the same aircraft can be available as plans built airplanes, or you can still make it all yourself if you want to. Yeah, sure. Uh, and of course, that's the, the way down on the bottom on the, the out-of-pocket expense, yeah. and it's way at the top as far as the effort and the time that effort you have Effort and time, especially, yeah. yeah. I mean, because like you said, you have to build the fixtures yeah. and jigs Everything, to yeah. make the parts. And that's that's the, 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 the real way to spread the cost out is to do it yeah. that way, but it really spreads the cost <laughs> and out. And it spreads out the time, yeah. too. Yeah. And so, but with the standard kit, or <laughs> even the quick build kits, they will sell them incrementally. So you can buy just a fuselage kit, or just a wing kit, or just an empennage kit, and that way you can you know, spread that cost over time, and as you finish something, then you can move on to the next thing. So sure. Really nice. And the nice part about that, too, is as you're learning your skills of sheet metal airplane building, mm -hmm. uh, you start out with simple stuff. The empennage, relatively simple, but yep. those skills transfer into building fuselage, wings, wings yep. final assembly. Right. And so, so you're building up your skill set and mm -hmm. on a part that is manageable. Yep. The key is time, though, right. and, exactly. and the big, most important part of all of this is just work in your airplane as much as possible, even small segments. Every, yeah. every little bit counts. Every day. If you, uh, they, they say that if you can do a little bit every day, it will get finished. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't have to be hours a day. It can be a half an hour a day. Yeah. But if you skip a day, you've lost the day. You know yeah, I mean? you can't buy back time. You can't buy back the time. <laughs> you can so. buy tools, but you can't buy <laughs> <Right>. back time. <laughs> exactly. So, so you want to stay at it. And uh, part, of that, uh, part of that equation is the fact that you want to make it as, as convenient as you can to go and do that work in your basement or in your garage or maybe yeah. a home shop that's right as at your house. As close as you can possibly do because it. Because yeah. if it takes you five minutes to walk out to the shop, you'll probably do that every day. But if you have to drive a half an hour to the airport to work on the airplane, probably not gonna do that every day. Your brain works against you that exactly. way. Exactly, <laughs> yep. So, so you need to try to make it as convenient as you can so that you actually do easily spend that time and work a few on minutes it. a day and, and, and that's the way it gets finished. Sure. Yep. So we've talked about the, the, the two most popular kits right now, mm. standard kit, quick build kit right. or slow build, fast build. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and then there's two paths in terms of the primary construction. One is primarily what we call solid rivets, yep. which is a standard kind of technique that has been building aircraft for forever. Yeah, since the 30s. Yeah, and then using pull rivets. Right. Like pull rivets have been around for a long time. Pop rivets, as they're called, as yeah. a as a uh, kind Generic of a term, yeah. yeah right <laughs> but uh, we're using commercial and or aerospace quality rivets correct the yeah. difference is is the, with the pull rivets it's a much faster build time because mm -hmm. there's less equipment the equipment is basic in terms yeah. of, of of setting the rivets mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily need multiple people I mean right. you can do everything by yourself but with Most driven rivets you, yeah. you need there are two some people. places on, a, on an airplane that's put together with driven rivets where it's impossible to do it unless you have two people exactly back in the fuselage tail cone or something like yeah. that you're just going to need people to crawl so if you look at that graphic real quick again we see a typical vans rv style aircraft with the solid rivets so the solid rivets require a rivet gun bucking bar rivet set and some other things to mm -hmm. drive those rivets with the pull rivets it's very simple uh, zenith sonics aircraft like that mm -hmm. uh, and and the new R uh, rvs yeah the rb12 rb12 yeah. specifically yep. are using pull rivets so we're using a pneumatic pull riveter or a manual pull riveter, right, and there's one, in fact, here we have uh, an example of each. Yep, there's your so here's our rivet gun, bucking bar combination for solid rivets, and this is what we'll be doing and demonstrating today, mm -hmm. and then the pull rivet, which uh, is the easy peasy way to do it. Yes, exactly, <laughs> one, one man, simple operation, very simple. Um, the, pull, uh, the driven rivets are more uh, traditional in that you go back and look at any factory built airplane, your Cessnas, your Pipers, your Beechcraft, all the old warbirds, yeah. any of that stuff, those were all put together with, with the driven type rivets. Yep. And that was that's kind of the, 
the legacy way to build aircraft. Yeah. They, they didn't develop the pull ribbon technology until later on. Sure. And there are various different kinds, as you mentioned, of pull ribbons. There's the hardware store, what they truly call pop, pop ribbons, ribbons, which are yeah. aluminum. Right. Uh, you know, typically in the air, uh, aerospace industry, we're, looking, we're either looking at stainless steel or, yeah. or some form of steel ribbon yep. or some other alloy that's, you know, a structural strength right. um, so that's designed for uh, that particular application. Yep. Exactly. So once we get our aircraft picked out, now mm -hmm. we have to get it set and get a place ready to go yep. in terms of building it. Yep. So let's talk a bit about workshops. So uh, pulling up the graphic here, this is a, a picture of my workshop actually. So what I did is I added onto my garage. Mm -hmm. I had a 20 by 24 foot garage and then I added another 20 by 24 foot section. So one of the keys with any kind of workshop is you want to be comfortable. This is not a job. Right. This is an enjoyable experience. So you want to have it heated. You want to have it air conditioned yep. in, in hot, hotter areas yep. uh, and lots of great lighting. You need, that is the key. Uh, if, it's, if you have poor lighting, it's gonna, you're going to struggle to do a lot of these tasks. You really the, are. The, the, most, the more light you can pour on the thing, the better off you are because when you get your head in there and your hands in there, you're going to cause some shadows. If you can get light coming in from various directions so that you can still light that area and work, it's going to make a big difference. Huge difference, big yeah. Difference. And so when I built my shop, I was aware of that. Yeah. So I put in 16 eight foot fluorescent light bulbs. So it lights it up like a that TV should, studio. That, that should cover it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. That's what makes it, that's what makes it easy to and do it's, the work. And it's right outside the door. Yep. So I, it's close yep. and it's it, perfect. it makes it really easy uh, to work on uh, whatever yeah. project I'm Whatever working project on. you're yeah. working on in the shop. Yeah, exactly. Here's another example of a workshop. So this is one we built uh, here at EA, the staff uh, the 750 uh, stole, stole airplane, mm -hmm. uh, where we had a corner of the, our Kermit Weeks hangar right. and had it set out. I mean, it wasn't an enclosed space, but it was a space that we could go to all the time. Right, yeah, you, it, was, it was confined to your, you know, you, you didn't have to pack the project away and, and get it back out again every time, and which that's is a an, big key. That's yeah. another part. You know, yeah. if you're sharing your garage with your car, yep. you got to pull the car out, bring the project out, work on it for a while, when you're done, you put it all put away. it all away. <laughs> put your car back. Yeah. And so, kind of go so that again Eats up cuts time. into your time because you're yeah. not just building. You've got all this time spent resetting the shop every time you want to start over and get back at that project. Yeah, you got to set your shop up and then work a little bit and then tear it down and then start all over again. Yeah, so it really adds the time. That's a so tough part. If you have a, a a dedicated space that you can just leave stuff set up. You walk away when you come back. It's all ready for you to go back to work. Sure. Again. Now that said, if you're in a position where you don't have access to a shop or a garage, you can still start. A friend of mine started building his RV uh, empennage on his kitchen table mm -hmm. in his an apartment. So yep. I don't know how he got away with that, but it, he got it. it he works. got the airplane done. It so and yep. many people have done this. Yep. I've seen folks building airplanes in their townhomes yep. where they're building the wing in their hallway. Yep. They put the spar. Uh, out on the back patio and worked on it there. Right, exactly. <laughs> so you can do just you about anything. The front end of the fuselage is in the living room and the back end's in the kitchen. I mean, this, that's not a joke, it's been done. It's true. The only thing is you have to have an exit plan. You, you have, have to, to make sure you, you have to get, get it, out. it out of there. Yeah. <laughs> There's been more than one aircraft that were completed in the basement and then they had to take a wall out of the basement to get the airplane out, which sure. is, uh, that's a major project at that point. Exactly. But it can be done. It, it can be done. Been, it has been done. And that's the tail end of the project. Now yeah. let's talk about delivery, the yeah, front end that, of the project. That's the first thing you have to get is the, you have to get the project there. Right. So you're going to get a big box, a really big box. Really so big box. <laughs> here's a picture of a, a Sonics uh, kit. And what's neat about this is it's on a pallet, so it's it's sent by truck, of course, because right. it's a lot of material, very heavy. A lot of weight. Yeah. Uh, but they palletize it in a way that you can remove it box by box, so right. one or two people can easily dismember that and get it off the truck. Get it off the truck without having any like a forklift or any yeah. kind of other equipment or a loading dock or whatever the right. case might be. Other kits aren't like that. Right. Some are in wooden crates Giant that are maybe crates. 16 feet long yep. and four by four and, and weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. So you have to plan for delivery. Yeah, one of the things that you do when you're looking at the kit is you find out how it's delivered and make sure that you have a, a plan to take that delivery and get the thing off the truck because the truck driver is not going to help you take it off. No, That's not, not at his, all. Not his job. <laughs> not his job, um, exactly. So you got to have a way to do that, um, you know, either enough friends to pick it up and carry it or, or a, a forklift or something. Sure. So, uh, it is nice that most of the kit manufacturers are going to this compartmentalized shipping where they, they ship it in smaller packages strapped together so that you can 
kind of piece by piece. Get it, it makes off. more sense. Yeah, yeah. In the case of the Sonics too, you use the pallet as your workbench. Yeah, you can make you can use the pallet and make a workbench out of it. No, and, and uh, yeah. so that's that part's taken so, care of for so you. So you too. get a lot of extra value that way. Exactly. So that's that's one thing to consider. And then yeah. what where do you put the kit? Right. And that's something to consider as well. Where are you going to store all those parts? It's, yeah, especially if you buy on. the entire kit in, yeah. a, in a block, which is a little bit more economical because it does cut your shipping costs down. And, and, it, and, and it you should get a value. From and, and it protects you from cost increases down the road as yeah, well. So exactly. there is that. Um, but yeah, then now, you, now you've got a storage issue. I'm, I'm going to work on the empennage, but I've got you know wing spars and, and sheets of aluminum that are going to be yeah. wing skins and all this stuff that you got to figure out a way to to store them and protect them so yeah. that you don't damage them while they're in storage. So exactly, that's part of the process. That's as a well. big part of it as yeah. well. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about how easy it is. Okay. So if we uh, take a look at the big picture here on the table, it's a lot of stuff here. But at the end of the day, it comes down to these things are really easy to do. Right. Literally, anyone watching, you can build an airplane. There's no doubt about it. Yep. You don't need any special skill sets. You do need some special tools, and we'll talk about that. Right. But it's really, really easy to do. With the new computer-aided design and manufacturing, kit manufacturers have gotten it down to the point where, like I mentioned before, it's almost like Lego, mm -hmm. putting things together. A great example of that is a, a part that I'm going to bring out. Yep over here. It was a little too big to uh, keep it in the shot originally. Yep. There you go. And I'll kind of peer around the corner here. So this is a Zenith rudder. Yep. And I participated recently in a Zenith virtual build where we were all sitting at home uh, at the start of this craziness uh, building uh, airplane parts. Yep. And uh, Zenith offers a rudder kit that you can start and get a feel for what you want to do in terms of building an airplane. Mm -hmm. So this was shipped to my house in a big crate and uh, we put it together as a joint project uh, online. Mm -hmm. And it turned out fairly decently, it's I very, think. Very, very nice, yeah. So, and how long did it take you? It took me three hours. Three hours. So three hours to build a rudder. Took, a, took an entire rudder kit and put it together ready to go in three and hours. And this is one of the major surfaces in an airplane. Right, exactly. Everything and else this, is just a little now bigger. Now this is the, the pull rivets we talked about. Yeah. So that, you can do, it by your, do it by yourself. Did it by myself. You don't have to have any help with the bucking bars or right. any of that stuff. But so. this is an example of how quickly and how easy it is yeah. to do things now. Exactly, and, and the, the same process will be done to build your uh, horizontal stabilizer so they take another three hours or so and you'd have those done yeah. and uh, you know pretty soon the whole tail is completed and you basically spent a day yeah you know. it's crazy yep. because it's in, back in the day if you were building a, she, uh, a scratch built airplane that whole thing would probably take I would bet a year yeah, maybe not By the time you quite, get everything yeah, cut and trimmed. If, and, if you had started out with raw materials and had to do all the layout, all the yeah. cutting, all the drilling, at, and and plus you've got some ribs to form there, so you'd have yeah. to make some form blocks and, and do that. That's, that's a lot of time. It's a lot of, a time. Lot of time. Yeah, it really is. So it's so easy to do now. Yep. So the other thing that's really important, we talked about setting up your workshop yep. and anticipating getting things ready for delivery. Right. But one of the most important things beyond tools is following the instructions. Follow the directions. That's yep. critical. Yep. Now, on, to that note, the manufacturers have really itemized and provided checklists and very mm -hmm. detailed drawings. Like we mentioned before, the original drawings that you get with a scratch built were sometimes hand drawn yep. and kind of vague. Very rudimentary in some, in some Nowadays, way. all the manufacturers have a step-by-step -step checklist with reference drawings that yep. makes it really easy. Yep. All we have a, a graphic up here yep. to show that. Yeah, all computer drawn and everything's all, uh, you know, part numbers are all laid out for you so you can go and pick out the exact part you need and it tells you which order to put them together and it's just very, very simple. It's like, it literally is like building a model airplane. It it's is. It's a big giant model airplane. Just a big giant model yeah. airplane, exactly. yeah. And it, it, because it's step by step, you know where you are in the process. Yep. You're not gonna miss anything. Yep. And it just takes a lot of the burden of thinking everything through. Yep. You just, you're working off of one line at a time you're not overwhelmed right. with everything. And it's an easy way to keep track of what you've done and what you still have to do because when you finish a, a, a segment, you mark it off right on your plans that we did this on this date. Now I know that's done, I can move on to the next step and, and you just keep working your yeah, way Yeah, right you just keep it. on checking things off and eventually yeah. you're gonna check off. Air, flow the airplane. Flow the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so the other big thing is tools. Yep. Uh, with a sheet metal airplane, you need a collection of tools to build the structure. Right. Now, for most sheet metal airplanes, there are some specialty tools that you need. 
Correct. It's not stuff you can buy at the hardware store. No. Uh, we have kind of the, uh, a suite of tools lined up here, but if we look at a tool list, it might look something like this. A whole bunch of specialty tools. The, the, the two things that stand out in terms of tools that you just can't go out and get really easily mm -hmm. would be like rivet gun, bucking bar, right. some of the temporary fasteners, yep. uh, some things that help to modify the sheets yeah. for installing flush or countersunk rivets and right. things like that. Right. By the time you're done, you're probably talking a tool investment of maybe starting out $600, $700, maybe $1,500, something right. like that. Depending on what you already have. Like if you, if you, yeah. don't, if you don't have an uh, air compressor, that's going to be a few hundred dollars extra because you need to get one to drive yeah. these tools. Um, you know, but if you have one already, then you've already got that covered. So that, that's one less thing you have to yeah. devote to the project. Exactly. You know, so. so companies like Aircraft Spruce have partnered with the manufacturers and they've actually developed specialty tool kits depending on the aircraft that you're building. So there'll be like a Sonics starter kit, right. an RV starting kit, a Zenith starting kit, and some of the special tools that each manufacturer uses, like for example, Zenith uses some special tools just for their airplane design. Right. So you get those through partners like your Aircraft Spruce. Right. So exactly. you don't have to be searching. No, all you over don't have floor. to. That uh, that uh, that's all figured out ahead of time. You can go right to either the the kit manufacturer's website or Aircraft Spruce's website, and yeah. you'll see that those stuffs itemized for you, and you can see, oh, God, I've already got a couple of these things, maybe or not, yep. and you just go right down and order what you need. Sure. So let's talk about some of the tools uh, that we have here. I'm just going to set our demonstration part to the side. Uh, one thing that everyone recognizes right away would be this tool here. A drill, common yep. drill. Okay. Common drill. Yep. We're going to get that so we can see that in the picture. Now, everyone probably has or has used a battery-operated drill. Yep. You could use that. Absolutely. Uh, in sheet metal work, though, we'd recommend an air drill. And the reason why is that an air drill has a uh, higher RPM. Mm -hmm. And when you're drilling holes in sheet metal, that high RPM translates into faster work, yep. but also a cleaner very hole. Cl very much cleaner hole. Yep. Yeah. The smaller the diameter of the cutting device, in this case a drill bit, mm -hmm. the faster you want it to spin. Mm -hmm. When you talk about a battery drill, uh, it's much slower. It will get the job done. Right. And in some respects, it's a little bit easier because there's no connections yeah, to it. Yeah, you don't have any hoses or cords exactly. or anything. Yep. But because it, it spins at such a low RPM, five, six hundred. It takes, takes quite RPM. a bit longer for each hole. Longer to, to, to do, drill those and it's holes. not the hole is not quite as crisp. No, you no, know. no. Mm -hmm. So you definitely want to get an air, an air drill, yeah. and as you mentioned, that begs having an air compressor. Right. So you you'll need an air compressor to drive those. Yep. And uh, what is nice about a lot of the newer air drills now is that because you don't have a motor in the drill, mm -hmm. they're smaller. Yes. You have basically just the uh, little turbine that spins the, the right. shaft, yep. but your your motor is the big compressor yep, in the corner. Down in the corner behind you, yeah. So they make them very ergonomic yep. and, and easy to handle, and they can get in the tight spaces. So right, exactly. it works out really nicely. Yep. So drills are one big thing. The other thing that's the big deal is a rivet gun and bucking bar. So this is not something you'd see uh, typically on like a Zenith or a Sonics where you're doing pull rivets. Right. There are some driven rivets on some of those, but for the most part, especially with the quick build kits, the kit manufacturer is taking care of most of that for you. Yeah. Um, there may be a few that you have to drive, but if it's just a few, uh, this is a great place to go to your local EA chapter. Uh, and talk to some of the yeah. other builders in the area. There might be somebody that's already has this equipment that it, maybe if you just need to drive a few rivets, they'd lend you or come over and help you. Sure. And use that EAA family, that EAA connection to, to take care of that rather than having to go out and buy your own just for a few rivets. And that's an amazing part of our community as EAA members is we can work with each other and rely on each other's help when right. we're doing things, and exactly. that's something that you don't see anywhere no, else. No, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful community to be involved in yeah. because everybody's there to help everybody else. It's just the yep. EAA way. It is. Yep. So some of the other specialty tools that you don't commonly see are temporary fasteners. They're called Clecos. And a Cleco is basically just a spring pin. It acts like a, a temporary rivet. Exactly. And we'll show how that works in a little bit. But that's something you just can't go down to Lowe's. Yeah, you won't, you won't find those yeah. in any of your big box stores or yeah. any of your hardware stores in, in the, your local community. Yeah. Another, another more uncommon tool, too, is called a rivet squeezer. Mm -hmm. Now, a rivet squeezer allows you to do uh, driving of rivets. Uh, 
by hand, by basically. Hand, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's a little more a technical, a little more accurate, a little yeah. more repeatable result. And it's quiet. And it's very quiet. So yeah. if you're doing this in your basement or even out in your garage, the more the rivets you can squeeze with the squeezer, yeah, the, the less bit. noise you're going to make, which is going to make everybody else in the house happier. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that, that's a special tool. And there's a few other tools too, mm -hmm. but that makes up the suite of the basic tools. Literally mm -hmm. the tools that we have on the table, the tools that we showed on that list just a right. moment ago are the essentials you need. Right. Now, with anything, you can never have enough tools. No. So there's always cool tools that yep. you can add on to that. But to start out, this will get these you are going. the basics. This will get, get you going. going. Yeah. Right, exactly. exactly. So let's talk about actually building a project. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have uh, on the table here, just a simple project. This is a, a project similar to what we do in the EA Sport Air Workshop sheet metal mm -hmm. workshop. Uh, in fact, uh, right over there, if you want to grab that, Joe, it's, uh, that's, this is the project that we do in the workshop. Just to give you an example of some of the things that you can do in advance mm -hmm. beyond your kit manufacturing, right. you know, starting with the empanage or anything like that. Uh, in the workshop, we do uh, a project that en encompasses driven rivets, mm -hmm. a hinge surface, so you get some practice on installing hinges and, mm -hmm. and sandwiches of multiple parts, multiple layers, yep. uh, flush rivets, the round head or protruding head rivets. Mm -hmm. We also install an access panel, a double door door. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually create the ribs and sure. install those as well. But the techniques that you need in this little part pretty much covers everything you need everything when you're you building the, the big airframe. Yep. Yeah. So that's what we're actually kind of work on today is uh, this sheet metal part. Mm -hmm. Now we talked about laying out and drawing and things like that. The great part about it now is kits will have the parts pretty much done, mm -hmm. like this example here. We've got the part cut to size. If there's any holes that have to be done, mm -hmm. larger holes for yep. openings, like for inspection, inspection panels or whatever, yep. that's done. Yep. And one of the most important and challenging things that uh, is the layout. Yep, layout of the ribbon. Right, so we have the holes already pre-done, either a laser cut or punched or drilled mm -hmm. by the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And that's just a matter of Lining it up so and, much time yeah. uh, as opposed to having to sit there and figure out, you know, I need X many rivets in this length, and how many, how, you know, what's the Yeah, I mean, you get the ruler out, okay, and yeah. it, it might say 10 or 7 equally spaced rivets between point A and point B. So you measure, and that's, yeah. you know, 7 and 3 eighths, and right. start doing the start math. Start doing the math, yeah. <laughs> this way, it's, to, it's right there. It's right there, exactly. Yeah, so You've already got your template to go by. It's easy to, easy to do. Yep. Now, in this particular example, we have just one part already pre-done, right. but most of the kit manufacturers, especially the quick build kits, they'll have both parts Right, and the only, the only time they generally don't do both parts is if there's a, a multiple layer thing that has to all go together. It's, it's, it's easy to do two parts that are made up, but if you get a third part in there, sometimes that's a little bit more challenging yeah. from the design standpoint. So they'll leave at least one of those parts undrilled. Sure. So you match up two of them and then drill the other one to match. So you kind of do your own match hole tooling yep. at that point. So you will find some of these just like this where one part is drilled and the other parts are not. Sure. So the kind of the basic steps in, in building a sheet metal airplane is, mm -hmm. is laying the part out, mm -hmm. cutting it to the right size, laying out the holes. We've that, got that partially Everything's done, all done yeah. with that. Yep. Uh, the next part is deburring mm -hmm. and cleaning up the part after you've cut it out or modified it. Right. So that's important. Deburring is getting the rough edges off the part, be it in a drilled hole or around the edge right. of the part. And right. that's done with some special tools. Here's a deburring tool. This is called a, a, a V-notch deburring tool. And basically what we do is we pull that along the edge of the part, yep. and it just cleans up the edges. The manufacturer's not going to spend time doing that. No, That's stuff that you'll do. Whatever little slag is on there from their laser cutter or their punch or whatever, they're going to leave that on there, and that's part of the builder's responsibility yeah, to, to, clean it to, off. to clean those parts off. So yeah. you deburr the edges, yep. smooth out the edges right. uh, with deburring tools like this. Mm -hmm. there, are other, some, there are other more mechanized versions, but this works Various really, really different well. ways to do it. Yep. yep. And then what we do is we're going to be uh, drilling holes and then deburring the holes. Right. So in this particular example, we're going to do what's called matched hole drilling. Mm -hmm. So we're using one part as a template that will be drilling holes in the Transfer other part. Transfer to the other part, yep. So we do that by first lining up the part, and then we use uh, some of those special fasteners we mentioned. In this case, it's going to be a Clico clamp. 
So what a Clico clamp is, is basically a spring clamp that you use on a set of what's called Clico pliers. Yep, and here's what they look like. And it's just, just a way to manipulate the clamp. Yeah, and you'll see as I squeeze the pliers, the clamp opens and it's spring loaded, the clamp shut. So I can put that on the edge of my material there and that's going to hold that fast while we uh, get our first couple of holes in there. So we'll yeah. put a couple of those clamps on there, making sure we're properly aligned. And locked in. And locked in. Now, if I can get the pliers off, there we go. Great. Now we've got that part aligned so that we can, so that we can drill it. Do some drilling. So we have the air right hose there. hooked up right over here to our compressor in the other room. Mm -hmm. And I've got the appropriate drill in. So we're putting in 332nd inch rivets. Okay. Instead of 8th inch rivets this time. Okay. A little smaller rivet. Yep. Uh, so we're going to use the the holes that are already pre-done mm -hmm. on the top sheet and drill into the bottom sheet. Right. We want to put a, a little block underneath there, a block of wood, and that's going to help to support the part mm -hmm. and protect the drill bit from drilling into my finger, yes. <laughs> which is really important uh, as always, well. Always a good idea. Right. Yeah. So we're going to drill through. Just like that. And then we put in a temporary fastener here's called that, a Clico. Here's that Clico again. Now these are the ones that are spring loaded and they're basically our temporary rivet if you want to think of it that way. You put yeah. it in the hole and when you release that spring pressure, those jaws spread out and grab the bottom piece and sandwich it in there so that the spring is holding those pieces together very snugly. For yep, us. exactly. So we, we need at least one more hole. Yep, to get it, keep it aligned. And we're going to come over here to drill. Okay. There you go. So then put another click in. Now I'm going to drill the, uh, one more hole using the battery drill just to give you an example of the difference there. Get this click in there for Squeeze. you. Yeah, yeah perfect. Whoops, I didn't get the whole thing. Yep, that click is That's a worn out click. That one's a worn out click. Yeah, we're going to we're going to replace that with one that might actually hold. Perfect. There we go. Get this clamp out of the way there. Yeah, so when we have at least two Clecos in, there's not going to be moving around. You'll see uh, on some of the blogs where a person has put a Cleco in every, every single... Every hole, yep. That looks, it looks like great. a porcupine. Like a really, porcupine. really interesting <laughs> looking, but totally unnecessary. Totally, but it looks great but when you have friends over. It is. It's very, very much a good talking point. Right, so. exactly. So we have two Clecos in. Really don't have to worry about things yep. moving around. Everything's going to be We're going to drill one more hole now uh, with the... Uh, electric drill and you can see how much longer this takes yeah. you can hear the sound is way slower yeah you can actually see that the drill is turning yeah. slower and it took you know three times the time to get that hole in there it did the job but it's not quite as efficient as the air drill exactly so I mean if, if that's all you have that's fine we don't need another Clico but we are going to go through and drill the rest of the holes okay so I'm going to go over here you can get in there without that, uh, that other squeeze going through there. there. there go. Got that one. You want to put the Clico in there? Yep, I can do that. Edges like to move around a bit, so we'll. Air drill so much faster. Oh, it's crazy, isn't it? And air drills aren't really super expensive either. I mean, no. you can start out with a basic one at $60, $70 and go up from there. The, the trade-off is the cost in, in terms of the uh, weight and, and mm -hmm. quality. So a $60 drill is great, but it's going to be heavy. It's going to be very loud. Right. A $200 or $300 drill is going to be very lightweight, very small, and, and very you can quiet. barely hear it. Yeah. Now, here's another point. If we were actually going to build this entire part, we'd go around and we'd drill all those holes and put a few Clecos in. Yeah. To get everything if I, squared up. If I take that apart, that part looks the same on all four sides. How do I get it put back together exactly. in the right orientation when I will go to finally, because we're going to have to take this apart and deburr these holes. Yeah. We got to make sure we get it back together so that our holes all still line up without having to guess at it. This is a custom puzzle piece. Exactly. So how do we do that? What we're going to do is we're going to take our marker right here and we're going to put a witness mark of some kind on here. And I'm just going to, up here in the corner, I'm just going to put the letter A right there and then right below that on this part I'm also going to put a letter A right underneath that same location sure. so that I line up part A to part A yep. and I know that those holes are going to line up for me all the way around right. if we were to drill all those Because we holes. are building a custom part. Exactly. So we want to make sure that we don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out which way it goes. Yep. So now we can take the Clecos out 
and go back to deburring. Mm -hmm. So we deburred the edges of the part with that edge deburring tool. Yep. We need another special tool that we use to deburr the drill holes, and that's called a rotary deburring tool. Yep. And basically, it's a or a swivel deburring tool. Yep. And basically, you go through each hole and deburr. Yep, exactly. And it's it, this is not a real difficult process. All you're doing is is putting the point of that deburring tool in the hole, if I can do that and just give it a couple of quick twists like that. Yeah. All you're doing is just knocking those big burrs off there. And the reason you want to do that is because if you leave those burrs on there, um, those can get underneath the rivet or in between the two sheets, yeah. and it'll give you a false set on the rivet. It's actually taking up a little space. Spreading and it, it out. And the yeah. rivet's not driving down as tight as it, it should be. And that's fine at first, but as parts vibrate and move around, that those the burrs disintegrate to dust yeah and now you've got a void in there and it's and a loose part so the rivet is loose then yeah and you don't want that so that's why we have to deburr after we do all our drilling yeah. and cutting and, and again like you say doing both sides yep. yeah you got to do both sides because there are burrs on both sides and uh, both parts and both parts that's even exactly though this right. has been drilled or pre pre-drilled yeah. from the manufacturer you still want to go through and make yeah sure even, even if they were drilled to the full size and you didn't have to do any drilling on them you should still deburr them because like even a laser drill leaves a little bit of a Flag there. Yeah. So you, regardless of what your process is, whether it was drilled by you in your shop or drilled by the manufacturer at their shop, you still need to go ahead and deburr that. Sure. Part. So I'm going to go ahead and deburr these just like we just did on that sheet there real quickly. It doesn't take much time. And you know, this is kind of fun. So people tend to do a bunch more cranks than they really need to. Well, that is definitely a problem. Yeah, you don't want to remove too much material. You don't want to champ for that hole. You just want to knock the burrs off. So it's really, really quick and simple. And in the back here, you can't get a full twist, but even just back and forth like that is all you need. Yeah. Just to knock just to knock those burrs off. I mean, that's that's plenty right there. That's and then nice. there's another trick I'll show you. You showed me yesterday, but yep. I get it this time. All right, you get to do it. Is we t in tight areas, we can take the deburring tool and then take the cutter right off the tool yep. and then just get it into that tight area. Yeah, you can just do it with your fingers and just a couple and little twist twists. It. Yeah. And that and that's, you're done. Yep, that's just fine. So like on this rear spar, which is much closer together, yeah, so if you were do if you were deburring it here. No, no way to get in with yeah. a deburring tool. So we that's have to the get way in you there would do it that. just yeah. like that. Yep. Right, so exactly. really, really simple. Great. Yep. I think we've got it pretty much deburred. Okay. You know the edges knocked off of there. Yeah. Get this one out here too. That one's up oh, there it is. Great. And we're also going to take off this other Clico set because we don't need those for this part of the project. It'll help to kind of get clean up our area so we can get in. Great. Okay, so we have our part. Yep. It's ready to go. Yeah, we check our witness mark to make sure that we're eggs going to put it together in the appropriate uh, orientation. Now you might have heard the term building your airplane several times. And that's the case when you're doing this because you're putting apart parts together temporarily, drilling, disassembling, deburring, and then reassembling and uh, you're literally building your airplane more than once. Right, and often if, if this ends up going on another sub-assembly, you might have to take it apart one more time to yeah. fit another part in there or to get something put together the right way. So there are, sure. there's a certain amount of repetitiveness to it in that respect, yep. but ultimately you end up, someday you're gonna put that rivet in there for the last time and it's gonna be finished. Yep, so that's, exactly. that's the goal. Now the fun part, we're gonna be doing some riveting, okay? So we're gonna be using uh, the air-driven rivet gun with a bucking bar. So the, the big thing with a rivet gun is getting it fine-tuned bef before you start riveting. If you look very closely at the gun, you'll see we have the gun itself. We have a rivet set, and the rivet set is designed to go over the cup, actually a little cup on the edge, edge mm -hmm. of the set, and that goes over the, the, the protruding dome of the head, rivet, yep. the dome of the rivet. Uh, and then on the business end where we plug in the power essentially our mm -hmm. air one of the most critical things is this little thing right here it's a little air regulator right it adjusts the power of the rivet gun mm -hmm. and what we're going to be doing is actually adjusting the power and we do this on a piece of wood or your workbench you never want to fire the rivet gun don't in the fire air. the rivet gun in the air and don't do it against your hand no there's a lot of power in that rivet gun and if you hit your hand just wrong you can injure your hand yeah. pretty severely yeah so you absolutely. always want to do it against the solid surface so what I tell people when they're starting the rivet is you want to make sure the rivet gun purrs like a kitten not roars like a lion that's okay. right so I'm going to turn it up a lot uh, so it has lots of power so we can get a, a 
uh, an idea of the difference. roar like a lion. So here's where it's really making a lot of noise. And this is, this is the sound that everyone associates with the river to gun. Lots of noise. Yeah. And a big hole in your workbench. And a big hole in the workbench, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to turn it down now. Regulate the power. That's all you need. That's all you need. You don't need yeah. a lot. Yeah, Huge notice difference. that didn't even drill a hole in the rivets. No, in the absolutely bench. not. Yeah. So we're all set that way. We have our rivets. Yep. So we're using a 332nd inch rivet. This mm -hmm. is what we call a protruding or roundhead rivet. Right. Okay. And that fits on the set. If we were using a flush or flathead rivet, we would use a different rivet set. It would look something like this. It's called a mushroom set. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that way the, the head, the manufactured head, is flush with the with the skin of the aircraft. Yeah. And sometimes that's necessary for various structural reasons. Exactly. But we're just going to do the roundhead rivets for today. We put the rivet in the hole. It's easy for you to say. Great. There we go. Now we're going to place the rivet gun on what's called the shop head. Now, the uh, pardon me, the, 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 the manufactured, manufactured head. head. Yep. So the manufactured head is the head that as it comes out of the bag, comes right. from, the, from yep. the manufacturer. The shop head is what we're going to be creating. Right. So we're going to put the gun there. And Joe's holding the bucking bar. The buck, bucking bar is just a solid, a very heavy of piece of steel. Yeah. And it's smooth uh, so that it do, it's got a nice flat surface that your rivet is going to drive. And what really is happening is the rivet gun is sending a force down through the rivet and it's actually bouncing this bucket bar off, and when the bucking bar rebounds back, is that's what's actually driving the rivet. Yeah. So it's a transfer of power through the through the rivet into the bucking bar and then back again. So the big deal here is we want to make sure the rivet gun is straight. We don't want it at an angle. Okay, so that's important. Yep. And we want to be pressing down on the rivet on the rivet gun side. Mm -hmm. The bucking bar just touching the rivet. Yep. And the reason for that is the rivet gun is going to hold and help to hold the sheets together. Right. And we don't want this to be bouncing off the parts. Right. So we're going to give it, you ready? We're I'm gonna ready. Give it a little blast here. You can probably turn up the power just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we can go a little bit more. You notice that my hand was just kind of bouncing around. Yeah. That was that rebounding that's actually sure. mushrooming them the what they call the shop head or the, the, the head that you create in your shop. Exactly. That's what that's doing. So how does that look? It's pretty good. Pretty we can good. check it with our we have So our little, after a while you'll get used to looking at rivets and how you form them. Uh, Starting out, we use what's called a rivet gauge. Yep, which is basically, we want this uh, shop head to be a certain size. We don't want yeah. it to be too small if we haven't driven the rivet enough. And we don't want it to be too large, meaning we overdrove the rivet. Yeah, and that's called that, a pancake rivet. Right, and what happens, is, especially if you do it too much and you make that, that uh, head too large, it'll crack and fall apart ultimately. Yeah. So we'll check with our, and look at that, it's just perfect. That's I, right I don't on. know if you can see it in the in the picture or not, but I've got this calibrated hole that we know that's the size we want that rivet yeah. head to be, and I slide it. It just perfectly fits. Yep. So, so basically, that's a properly driven rivet. Yeah, and the shop head is what, what we're looking at. Kind of a rule of thumb is whatever the diameter of the rivet is times 1.5, and that gives us actually times 0.5 is the is the the height the height in yeah. terms of the width the width yeah yep. 1.5 width and and 0.5 height of yep. what the original original rivet, rivet diameter, diameter was yep. Yep. exactly yep exactly and it's that simple it's that simple now yep. once you get the the first rivet set you've got the gun fine tuned yep and you have kind of a, a, an idea of the cadence and yep. this is it's it's almost like playing a musical instrument. Yep. <laughs> yep. You get to you know the sound, you know the feel, and you can just go down the line exactly. and do rivet after rivet after rivet. So now the, the other way to do it, especially on an edge like this, remember, is with our squeezer. Yeah. So if you have an easily accessible edge like this, right. so where, or, or, or even of. even inside here you could get in there. Yep. But you can use the squeezer and then it's even quieter because we're just gonna literally squeeze that rivet. And I'm gonna use the rivet we already set just to kind of set my squeezer depth here. Okay, great. So what the squeezer is, is a spring plunger, or, or, or rather a lever plunger. Right. What we have here, if you can see it in the picture, is we have uh, the same little cupped rivet uh, set here that we did in the rivet gun. It just it cups the manufactured head of the yeah. rivet. And on the other side of the squeezer, we just have a flat anvil that's going to be the bucking bar. Yeah. Except instead of hammering it together, we're just going to squeeze, squeeze it. it. So we got a uh, mechanical advantage here in our handle yep. that makes that squeezing that rivet very simple. So if you want to give me a rivet there, Mark, okay. I'll show just how easy this, this one right here. 
here. Yep, that's fine. We'll put it in. Yep, so I'm going to take this. For yep, you. you can hold that. I'm going to put my rivet set right over the top of that manufactured head, just like we did with our rivet gun. I'm going to bring this up until it makes contact. I want to make sure that I'm square and straight. I want right. to get a nice straight squeeze, and I'm just going to squeeze that handle until it stops. Yep. I've set the depth by uh, changing the length of my arm here. And I did it, I already had it set because I used the other ribbon as sure. a guide. Yep. But if you had a thicker material, you'd, you'd screw this back in a little bit for your thicker, or if you had thinner material, you'd, you could the adjust it. The plunger is way. adjustable, basically. It, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you can get whatever depth of yep. set you want. And then you look at the back, and we've got exactly, if you take our rivet guide here, yeah, exactly. I could have closed that one just a little bit more, so I could go back and do that if yeah. I wanted to. Just on the first few, you can find. Yeah, what happens tool. with the squeezer I found sometimes is that little anvil, yeah. because It'll of the amount of force, flex it actually a flexes It'll a little flex bit. Flex a little bit, yeah. yeah. And you can go back and do it again a couple of times. Every time you do it, the rivet gets a little bit harder, so ultimately you won't be able to squeeze it anymore because right. it'll harden itself. But that's that's the other way to do it, and this yeah. is again very quiet, very, very easy. quiet. And if if you if it's accessible like that, this becomes a one man job with a yeah. squeezer. So uh, uh, we always recommend that as many of the ones that you can do with a squeezer, the better off you are, both for your hearing and for your <laughs> for your <laughs> the, the household's uh, happiness is listening to that ribbon. Yeah, gun. well, everything it, it's a more controlled process. Yes, exactly. The problem is. You can do it for a majority of the areas of the right. part, but there are some areas that you just can't get because exactly. the anvil isn't big enough. Yeah, right. Or like in a fuselage or a wing where you're doing large sheets and a row of rivets, you becomes really challenging. There's no other way, way to do that except with a bucking bar. Yep. But but a lot of these smaller parts or around a, a inspection hole or something like that, easy you can to easily do. do them with yep. the, with the squeezer. Yep. Might want to turn that rivet gun up just one more notch, Mark. I think. Won't have to rattle it quite as much. Just give her just a little bit more oomph. One notch. There you go. Okay, ready? Yep. And there you go. A little bit more. It's about timing. Yep. And like I said, it's like playing a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. Although we're not putting you in front of a, of a piano, no. it's more like playing a kazoo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how simple it is. Exactly. Check it with our gauge. It's tight, but it's just about right. Yeah. So we know about what we did there, and we could go down that row and just about the same amount of uh, time on the trigger each one, and you'll get a pretty uniform set of rivets. And these are really close. Yep. It doesn't have to be a Swiss watch. No. Nope. You don't have to measure to the ten thousandths of an inch. No. Nope. We're, we're, not, we're not building Swiss watches. We're building really fancy farm tractors. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to get crazy about it, you build a Swiss farm tractor. You, you could, go you could do that. Yep. But what it comes down to is don't get crazy about measuring out the micrometer every time. Right. You really Each don't way. have to do that at all. And then, of course, when you get to this point, now we've got, got several got rivets that are holding it in place. Yeah. We don't need the clecos anymore. We can pull anymore. the clecos anymore, and then you could complete yeah. the job. Yeah. Exactly. So we have a few minutes left. What the next step would be is to continue that process, right? And go all the way around. Yep. Make your parts yep. and whatever other additional parts would be included in this. Your uh, reinforcing uh, ring for the inspection cover, or uh, as with our project here, um, you'd have to uh, get that hinge fitted in there and drill that, yeah. and then that would be riveted in on both sides. And so just step by step by step, following those instructions from your kit manufacturer. Yeah. And you just keep building on what you've started. Build onto that. Build onto that. Yeah. And just Pieces of a puzzle. It's really that's what it comes down to. But yeah. I, I really want to emphasize that this is so easy to do. It's really not that hard. Not Anyone can do it. Not at all. It's so one of the next steps, and a question that I get asked all the time is, how do we protect our airplanes mm -hmm. in terms of corrosion proofing, right. painting, and things like right. that? So wh what are some of the good steps to do? Um, there's several different ways you can do that. And the first thing to remember, and we didn't mention it before we put our project together because it was already partly together, but most of these uh, kit manufacturers will ship these parts with a protective coating on them. Oh, yes, Usually right. plastic mm -hmm. of some kind that's, that's treated on there. You got to take that off before you put the parts yes, together. Yes, absolutely. You don't want that plastic in between there. Yeah. The other thing is, on the large sheets like your wing skins or your fuselage skins and that, they'll have those the whole sheet protected with plastic. 
sooner or later you got to take that off and the longer you leave it on there the harder it is yeah. to get off so if the project going on year after year yeah you like to protect your metal but you also want to be able to get that off get of it there, off yeah uh, without going through a lot of undue sure. stress so uh, you know kind of balancing act there to yeah. get that off when you when you you know, really can still mm -hmm. get it off there so yep. then once you get that uh, you're ready to final assemble everything um, there is some different treatments you can do depending on the atmospheric conditions you have uh, like I say up here in central Wisconsin where we don't have any salt air we don't have any industrial contaminants in the right. air very clean atmosphere um, the airplane would be fine without any protection into it right and it would last longer than I'm going to last mm -hmm. but um, sooner or later somewhere down the road that airplane's probably going to be up for sale and the person that buys it might live in Florida right so you need to think about what's good for you, but what's also good for resale value. Right. So a lot of the people even building here in Wisconsin will do some kind of corrosion protection on the aluminum aircraft. Yep. You know, some, there's several different coatings you can buy, very simple to put on, just very light coats that will just give you that layer of protection so that the atmospheric conditions can't get in there and start any kind of corrosion. Sure, you can buy them literally in spray cans. Yep, yep, you can get them in spray cans, or of course if you're gonna do all wing skins and that, you get, you know, get a, use your spray gun. Uh, and spray and, gun and, thing, and, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't hurt to, uh, and it doesn't add a lot of weight. You can get carried away putting it on. You wanna put it on as light as they say, uh, and don't think that more is better because it's really not. You're just adding weight to the aircraft. Sure. Um, so, you know, follow, again, follow the instructions. Follow the instructions. Do it the yeah. way it says, and you'll be just fine. Right. So. It's not that tough. It's not that tough. It's yeah. Very, in very fact, simple. some people, as you mentioned, don't even do any corrosion. Right. Corrosion Especially protein. like uh, some of the aircraft are, are built out of 6061. Yeah, like uh, the Sonics, alloy. for example. Yeah, and that's very, very corrosion resistant. Yeah. So unless you're really in a, a very caustic atmosphere, Don't coastal cities that. or high industrial uh, atmosphere, the airplane's going to last sure. many, 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 many years. So you know, keep yep. that in mind as well. So we talked about corrosion proofing. Mm -hmm. Then uh, obviously people like to paint their airplanes, yep. and yep. that's also a challenge as well because you have to get up to speed in terms of a painting, and right. that's a bit of an art form. Exactly. Uh, speaking from a person that's painted a lot of big structures, and yep. you, you too probably yep. as well. Yep. Exactly. You have to invest in a paint equipment and a place mm -hmm. to spray yep. a paint. Place Either have paint. to build your own temporary spray booth or have access to someone that has a good uh, spraying facility right. and all the protective equipment, respirators, um, you know, Tyvek suits, all that kind sure. of stuff. Sure. So you got uh, a lot of, a lot of, frankly, a lot of the builders of these metal airplanes uh, get buddied up with their local auto body uh, shop yeah. and take that guy out for pizza a couple of times, and maybe after hours some night he'll help you in his own paint booth. I've paint heard that's happened more than once. Exactly, <laughs> it certainly has. So there's always a, again, use the EAA community and the local community and get together, and, and you can uh, take care of a lot of those bigger projects that you might want to not in invest in that equipment yourself. And that's a great resource. Again, we've talked about EA chapters, but also the EA hints for home builders in terms of working with sheet metal airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the EA Sport Air workshops, we have an EA Sport Air workshop specifically for sheet metal construction that will take you from start to finish, from not knowing anything at all right. to being very building confident project, to building yeah. a very sophisticated project that you will get the confidence that you need to take it forward. Yep, exactly. Yep. And then of course, EA technical counselors yep. like you In mentioned. your local area, you've got your EA chapters, your EA technical counselors, there's, there's uh, people out there that are more than willing to help uh, and, and they enjoy helping and they enjoy sharing their knowledge and they enjoy your enthusiasm because you're building exactly. a project and it's, it builds on itself. It's, uh, it really it's just does. the EAA family. Yeah, amazing group of people that are mentors looking over your shoulder, helping you through. Right through tough stuff, and they're readily accessible through the EA website, and of course through the chapter network too. Exactly. And then, ultimately, you're gonna get it done, you're ready to test fly. Right. So what do we do? Then then you use it yet another EAA benefit, which is our EAA Flight Advisor Program. Yeah. Again, volunteers in your local area that have test flown aircraft, they understand the process, they understand the safety concerns, they understand how to put together a proper flight test program, and they'll sit down with you and help you make sure that you're doing it the safe way, the right way. Absolutely. And we have our new uh, EAA test flight manual that we right. just recently published yep, as well. The flight advisors will be able to walk you through that and show yep. you how that whole process yep. works too. Plan it out so you can do it safely. Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. But And there's a lot of great resources like that. So we have the flight advisors, the EAA technical counselors. Uh, we also have a DVD specifically on sheet metal construction, 
a workbook specifically on sheet metal construction that was authored by our EA Sport Air Workshop instructors. And I do want to mention again the Hints for Home Builders because that's exactly. an amazing resource. Over 500 videos that go through in small snippets, three to five minutes long, talking about specific aspects of the building All process. All kinds of different aircraft building techniques. Not yeah. only sheet metal, but everything else. Exactly. And of course, EA itself, give yep. us a call. If you yep. run into a bind, yep. we have our aviation services that can help you out and connect. Yep. And then of course, there's the community amongst builders themselves. Right. They have each, each of the major manufacturers have a community built around them. Vans, Sonics, Zenith, they have their own like users groups or owners groups, whatever you want to call it, that they'll share ideas specific to their particular designs. And there's just, there's help out there everywhere you look. You can do it. It's really easy. Yep, it's, it, and it's fun. It's fun. Exactly. And, and there's no greater joy than looking at that airplane you built and saying, I did that. I did that. I made that happen. Just amazing. It is. Thanks for tuning in this afternoon. I'm Mark Force. I'm Joe Norris. And we'll see you tomorrow with some more workshop uh, instruction on just about everything. Yeah, we've got uh, sessions for the rest of the week, and we'll, uh, we'll be able to show you how to do all kinds of interesting aircraft building techniques. Thanks for being a part of EA Together as part of the Spirit of Aviation Week. Uh, we're live from EA Oshkosh, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. With plenty of top-notch how-to resources, 